Hello, AP STAT students. We are going to be looking today at beginning section 10.2, where we compare two means for two different populations. You might remember in 10.1, we looked at comparing the proportions uh, from two different populations, where we looked at the problem about twins as the proportion of twins born to black and white moms different. We also looked at the problem about the proportion of people who ended up getting AIDS from the vaccine and people who got the placebo, the no vaccine. So today when we start looking at means, you guys should remember that, that as soon as we start talking about means, you have to begin using the T distribution. Proportions always work with Z scores and normal models, but now, with, now that we're working with means here, we gotta work with T distributions and T scores. So let's take a look at what we're gonna be doing. Uh, in this section, one of the main things we're we'll doing, we'll be checking the conditions for whether we can do inference. Inference is basically meaning creating a confidence interval or doing a significance test. Can we meet our conditions for some type of inference about the mean of population one minus the mean of population two? And if we meet those conditions, then we can go on, we can create a confidence interval to compare the two means, and we can do a significance test as well to test some hypotheses about the two means. So one of the main things we want to look at, uh, keep track now, the parameters that we're interested in are going to be mu sub one and mu sub two, where one and two represent the two populations. The two populations could be the mean uh, for males versus the mean of females. It could be the mean of people in Iowa versus the mean of people in Nebraska or whatever the two populations might be. And what we'll see is that we're going to take random samples from each one of the two populations, and then we'll try and compare the sample means against each other. So we might do that to compare treatments in an experiment, for example. We might look to see if a, a new medicine is the average result from a new medicine. How does it compare to the average of somebody on a placebo uh, or comparing it to an old medicine? The main thing to keep track of Again, when we're dealing with two populations, everything's going to come in two. So we're going to have two different populations. We'll have two different parameters, mean or mu sub one and mu sub two. And of course, when we take our samples, we'll get the statistics. We'll get the sample mean of group one and the sample mean of group two. And of course, we always got to keep track, too, of the sample sizes for group one and group two. So here's the problem that we're going to look at today. This is actually an old AP stats problem. It's from the year 2000 exam, free response number four. Uh, on our classroom post, I did put my work for this problem and I've also put the scoring rubric out there. So you'll be able to look at both of those. Uh, but do remember as we go through this video here together that you can always pause it and rewind it and, and go back to something if you need to. But here's what this problem is about. It's about baby walkers. So I'm just gonna read you, this is exactly what the problem said and then we'll get into it. It says, baby walkers are seats hanging from frames that allow babies to sit upright with their legs dangling and their feet touching the floor. Uh, walkers have wheels on their legs that allow the infant to propel the walker around the house long before he or she can walk or even crawl. Typically, babies use walkers between the ages of four and 11 months. And it goes on to say this, because most walkers have tray tables in front that block the baby's view of their feet, Child psychologists have begun to question whether walkers affect infants' cognitive development. So some people are questioning, since the baby can move around with the walker, but they can't actually see their feet, for some reason they're wondering, does that affect their cognitive or their mental development? So there's a study that was done that compared the mental skill scores of a random sample of those who used walkers with a random sample of those who never used walkers. So that's kind of a key statement right there because it's telling us what our two groups are, what our two populations are. We're gonna have babies that did use the walkers and we're comparing them against babies who never used the walkers. And we're looking at their, their mean mental skill scores. I do notice right away, it does tell me each sample was randomly chosen. So that's nice. So let's go get some evidence. So the evidence is this, and at this point I'm gonna uh, break out of the PowerPoint and get I'll get right back to that slide, but I'm gonna get a pen that I can, I can kind of mark with and highlight some things and see if this works. This is kind of new technology for me here. 
Okay, so here we go. So the evidence is, is the information we know about the samples. So it tells me we have an average mental skill score of 113 for 54 babies that used the walkers and their standard deviation was 12 points. Then we've got another group of 55 babies who had an average mental skill score of 123 with a standard deviation of 15 points. So that's a lot of numerical information that we'll have to use here eventually. But the first question on this AP exam problem, question A here said, suppose that a study using this design found a statistically significant result. Now remember what that means. If it's statistically significant, then it means that result, these, these numerical results that we have up here, they're unlikely to happen just by chance. So the question says, would it be reasonable to conclude that using a walker causes a change in mean mental skill score? And explain your answer. Um, there's one key word that shows up in there that anytime you see this word in stats, you really need to pause and think about it. And that word is causes. So they're wondering, is it reasonable to conclude that using a walker causes a change in mean mental skills score? Now, since the very beginning of the year, we've talked about this word and this idea is going to show up on your AP exam. The only way, you might remember this, the only way that we can say that one thing causes something else to happen is if we've done and set up a controlled experiment with treatments. And that's not the case here. There was no experiment that was done. You might remember it said on the previous slide that they just randomly selected some babies. They had a random sample of those that used walkers and a random sample that never used walkers. So when we answer this question, we're gonna answer it in this way. We're gonna definitely say no. And the reason you cannot conclude using a walker causes the change is because uh, this was not a controlled experiment. And so because of that, no cause and effect can be determined. And if you look at the rubric for this problem, uh, an answer that we just wrote there, that would be an E, uh, essentially correct. You had to say something that it's not an experiment, so you cannot conclude a cause and effect relationship. So that's question A. Before I show you question B, we've got to do a little bit of looking at what's coming up here. So what we're going to be working on uh, today is how do you create a confidence interval for the difference between the mean of group one and the mean of group two? So when we build confidence intervals, and I'm going to highlight a couple things here, if we meet our conditions, we can go ahead and build a confidence interval. And you might recall that when we start any confidence interval, they all begin with what we call a point estimate. And the point estimate in this case is just how far apart our two sample averages are. So every confidence interval begins with that point estimate. And then what we do from there is we add and subtract a margin of error. So everything I'm putting in red here is the margin of error. And remember, margin of error always has two pieces to it. Because we're dealing with means, we have a critical value that's going to be a t-score, and then we have a standard error. And we multiply that critical value times this standard error here. And again, that formula is on your formula sheet, and you'll get that formula sheet for the AP exam. So a couple of things to remember about as we do this. One thing, again, when you use t, you have to have degrees of freedom. And so we talked about back in chapter nine that when we only had one sample in one population, the degree of freedom was simple. It was just the sample size minus one. Well, here you have two samples and they can be different sizes like the one with the baby. So what do you do in this case? Well, one way that you can do this is you can use your calculator to get the degree of freedom or, and we'll show you how to do that eventually, but there's an easier way that I think and that's what I'm marking down here. The easiest way to get the degree of freedom is we're gonna do this. We're gonna say, what's the degree of freedom for group number one? Sample size, take away one. 
What's the degree of freedom for group number two? Sample size, take away one again. And then we're just gonna use the smaller of those two values. Um, what we'll see eventually is that's not the actual, the true degree of freedom for a problem like this. Uh, to get the true degree of freedom, you can either use your calculator again, uh, but you'll see it's, it's a really complex formula to do it. We don't ever have to do the formula. We can either use this shortcut right here or we can use the calculator. So before we do it, as always, you gotta check conditions here. So some of these conditions that we have to check, same conditions we've always seen here, um, we have to have a random condition that's met. So again, either you have random samples or else you have a randomized experiment. You have to have one of those two things. Um, the 10% condition again says your samples better not be too big. They have to be smaller than 10% of the whole population. And again, that is only when you sample without replacement. Again, if you had an experiment, you wouldn't even need to check that because you wouldn't be sampling. But the final condition that we have to check, this is the one you always gotta be careful with. Uh, so I'm gonna highlight a few things in here. Uh, the normal large sample condition here, this is one where you can meet it a few ways. And one of the ways, the initial way it says here is, do you know that both population distri distributions are normal? And very rarely are you even told that, or very rarely do you know that. Probably the most likely thing that's gonna happen is you'll check to see are the sample sizes large enough? Are both sample sizes bigger than 30 or equal to 30? And if that's the case, which is really common, then that's all you need to check. Now, if you don't meet either of those two, if you don't know what the shape is and your samples are too small, that's where we saw before back in chapter nine, you had to graph the sample data and you had to look to see, does it look roughly normal? And usually what we did there was we used a normal probability plot. And we just did that on the calculator. We entered the data in and we'd, we'd check it that way. And what you hoped to see was you hoped to see something where the data looked roughly in a straight line. And if that was the case, then we said that is a, a good piece of evidence that our population was probably normal as well. But again, we shouldn't use that if you see your graph is pretty skewed or if you have outliers, that's a big red flag saying you do not meet the condition. So let's go on, let's look at our actual problem here. So we talked about the baby walkers before. We answered question A, we said it was not an experiment, so we couldn't uh, determine that, that using a walker causes that change in the mean mental skill score. But now here's question B. And question B asks you, is there evidence that the mean mental skill score of babies who use walkers is different from the mean mental skill score of babies who do not use walkers? So a couple things I see here. I see this word evidence. And when they ask you for evidence, that typically means you wanna do one of two things. You either wanna make a confidence interval or you wanna do a significance test. You could do either one. That when you look at the rubric here for this problem, it does show you that a student could do either one and, and score full credit. Um, it asks you if we have evidence that the mean mental skill score is different from the mean mental skill score of, of babies that use walkers and babies that don't. So they're not asking you if one is higher or lower, they're just asking you if they are different here. So we'll try and keep that in mind as we work through the problem. So uh, I'm gonna turn to a blank page here and start to work this out. But remember, you might wanna go ahead and maybe pause right now and write down the facts, the evidence here uh, from our sample results. That's what I'm gonna start with here too. So I'm gonna rewrite the evidence that we had. So we have two groups. We have a group that use walkers. Here's my pen. Oops. Hold on. Gotta get the pen. Okay. Sorry, it's a little, that's a little out there. So we have the group that use walkers. Here's what we know about them we know that the average mental skill score, and I'm gonna use subscript W, uh, 
Average mental skill score is 113. We know that the standard deviation of the scores for the babies that used walkers was 12. And we know that the sample size of the babies that used walkers was 54. Now I'm gonna go ahead and also write on there the degree of freedom. The degree of freedom for this group would be 54, take away one, so 53. Um, I'm gonna make a group over here, the babies that do not use walkers, so the non-walker group of kids. Remember, those are Ws. Over here, I'm gonna use NWs for them. And let's record the same statistics. The sample mean for the group of babies that didn't use the walkers was 123. So the sample shows they have a higher average. Uh, the question is going to be though, just because they have a higher average in the sample, what do we think is true about the difference between these groups and the entire population? The standard deviation of these scores for the babies that did not use walkers is 15, and the sample size was just a little bit bigger at 55. Now that means that this sample has a degree of freedom of 54. Okay, so that's my evidence. I have to use all of that in order to try and make some sort of conclusion here. So I'm gonna to wanna to try and do this with a confidence interval. So we practice the idea of a confidence interval. Uh, here's in a confidence interval, remember we always do our steps of panic. So I'm gonna start setting up the step P, which is identifying the parameters. We have two parameters in this problem. One is the mean for the Walker group. So what is this? I'm identifying what it is. It's the mean mental score, however they might measure that on babies, I have no idea, but it's the mean mental score of babies that use walkers. And then of course we've got our second group, mu sub NW, this is the mean mental score of babies that don't use walkers. And what we are trying to do is we want to estimate what is the difference between the mean mental score of babies that use walkers and the mean mental score of babies that do not use walkers. So that's identifying my parameter. Uh, let's go ahead and check on this screen. Before I run out of room here, we'll check the conditions. So we know what the three condition checks are. One is random. So again, if you looked back at the, the problem, it clearly stated that both of the samples were randomly chosen. So I'm gonna write that, but I have to emphasize that I'm checking this for both. Both samples are randomly selected. So we're good with the random condition. Second condition was the 10% condition. And I do have to check this, this was not an experiment. So we did take samples. Uh, I have to make sure my samples are both, uh, neither one is too big. They have to be smaller than 10% of the population. So you might remember the easy way we check that. I have no idea what the population of babies that use walkers or don't use walkers is, but I am pretty sure that there are over, what do we have, 54 babies that used walkers. So I know there are over 10 times that, over 540 babies that use walkers and over, uh, what do we got here? 55 in that sample. So over 550 babies don't use walkers. And then our final check is, do we meet the large counts condition? Uh, typically on the AP problems, they're gonna, they're gonna help you check this one pretty easily because they gave us samples that are bigger than 30. We have 54 and 55, but we do have to mention for each one of them. So the sample size of the walkers is 54, and yep, that's bigger than or equal to 30. And the sample size of the non-walkers was 55, and that is also bigger than or equal to 30. So we meet our three conditions, and so that means we're good to move on. So doing our steps of panic, nope, lost the pen here. <laughs>
Hold on one second. Got to get the pen back. So the next step in panic is we have to show the name of what we're about to do here. So I'm going to create, and here comes the name, a two sample T interval. And I'm making a two sample T interval for the difference between the average of the walkers and the non walkers. So there's our PAN. Now, here comes the work. We got to make the interval. So here comes the I. So I'm going to rewrite the formula. The formula says start with your samples, and we're going to see how far apart they were from each other. That's my point estimate. Then I'm going to add and subtract. Here comes the margin of error, and there's two parts to that. There's a t-score, and then there's the standard error. So I'm going to do the, uh, the standard error formula, which is on your formula sheet, is I'm going to take the standard deviation of the walkers squared, divide by the size of the walkers, add to that the standard deviation of the non-walkers squared, divided by the size of the non-walkers. So that's my formula, that's what I'm going to fill in. Now again, I'm going to show you how to do this by hand, but I do want you to remember that it is totally acceptable to do this on the calculator and just show the result from the calculator. And I'm going to do it by hand, but I will show you how to do it on the calculator also. So now you might need to look back at your, your statistics from the samples that we had, but the results we had, the average score of the walkers, babies that used walkers, was 113. Average score of the non-walking babies was 123. And so I can see to start with, they have a difference of 10, minus 10, the order I subtracted. And the order I subtracted it in, again, you could have chosen the reverse order. It doesn't matter, but once you choose that order, you just stick with it. And now I've got to calculate the margin of error. Now that T-score, we're going to get that in a second. So I'm just going to pause on that. Here comes the standard error. I'm going to fill in the results for the standard error. So the standard deviation for the walking, babies that use walkers was 12. So 12 squared over 54 plus 15 squared over 55 for the non-walkers. Now, got to think about that T-score. So how do we find that T-score? Um, I don't remember if we said earlier, but I'm going to try and make a 95% confidence interval. So we're, I'm just going to state that. To find the T-score, here's what we got to do. So to find T, I'm going to picture again this model, and I'm looking for the T-scores that will put 95% right in the center. So if I have 95% of the center, and this is kind of symmetrical, this area out here is half of the remaining 5%, and this area out here is the other half, so 2.5%. And if I want to find that T-score when I know these areas, these probabilities here, I can do inverse T on the calculator, and I can put the area to the left. So I'm going to find this because I'm putting two and a half percent to the left. But I have to put in the degree of freedom. So here's where I'm going to use that shortcut. Remember before we had samples of 54 and 55 were the size. There they are right up here again. So my degree of freedom would be 53 for this one and 54 for that one. I'm going to use the smaller of the two. And so that's going to give me the T that I need to use. So how do I get that? Go over to your calculator. So I'm going to go to second distributions. I'm going to do inverse T. I'm going to put in the area that is to the left, 0.025, and I'm going to type in 53 degrees of freedom. Now it's going to give me the negative T score. So we have about negative 2.006 is what we're getting. I'm going to go back to my pen here, sorry. So negative 2.006 uh, but again the positive t score would be positive 
And when we fill this in for the confidence interval, you got positive and negative anyway. So here's the T, 2.006. And so now I'm gonna calculate what the margin of error is. What is all of this right here? So I'm gonna go back to the calculator. I'm gonna do all of that in one line, 2.006. There's my T, I'm gonna take that times the standard deviation, standard error, I should say, which is 12 squared divided by 54 plus 15 squared divided by 55. So I'm taking the T score times the standard error and I get about 5.215 is what it says. So we'll put that in here. So there's our margin of error. Now I'm gonna create the confidence interval. I'm gonna go back to the calculator. I'm gonna take negative 10 plus that margin of error. I'm gonna do negative 10 minus that and get the interval. So I'll do them both over here at once. I'm gonna subtract it to get the smaller value first. So there's the low end of my interval. Then I'm gonna add it, negative 10 plus five point. Two, one, five. So here's our interval from those two values. Negative 15.215 up to negative 4.785 about. That's our interval. And we did all that by hand. Now, can you do it on the calculator and get the same result? Yeah, and it's totally acceptable on the AP exam. So to do that, I'm gonna remind you how we do it here. Let's take a look. To get the interval created on a calculator, everywhere we've done that before, we've gone to stat, we've gone to tests. Here's a whole bunch of the different tests that we've done. I'm gonna look for option zero, a two sample T interval. And I'll kind of plug right now, I already put on Classroom for you a, a packet that showed every calculator test and interval that we've ever done or would have done in class during the year. And that's on Classroom. It shows you step-by-step step how to enter them in with a lot of calculator screenshots too. So I'm gonna to go to this and let's put in our data. Um, actually, I don't have the data. I don't have the actual scores for these 50 some babies in each group, but I do have the statistics. So group number one, the babies that used walkers had a mean score of 113. They had a standard deviation of 12, and they had a sample size of 54. Group number two, the babies that did not use the walkers had a mean score of 123, a standard deviation of 15, and there were 55 of them. And I'm going to plug in the samples, or sorry, the confidence level we want is 95. And it asked me this question, do you want to pool? We're not going to pool here. The only time we ever pooled was when we did a significance test about the difference of two proportions. You might wanna look back at the problem we did about the AIDS vaccine to see where that was and how we did that. But general reminder, if the calculator asks you if you want to pool, the answer is always no. If the calculator needs to do this pooled idea, it will just do it automatically and not ask you. So I'm gonna hit no. And then we'll go down, we'll calculate it. Let's see how close we got. The calculator says negative 15.16. We got just a little different. Calculator says negative 4.84. We were, again, just a little bit different. Um, if you're thinking that looks like we're a little bit too different, even though it's kind of close, the reason for that goes back to this degree of freedom. We use the shortcut, 53. The true degree of freedom popped out here and we did the calculator. The true degree of freedom is 102.82 about. Now, how you get that is a big, messy formula that you'll never have to use, but the calculator will do it for you. But it's okay just to do this. It's also okay to replace all this work and to say from the calculator, here is my interval. Now, hopefully you remember the final step to this problem, to a confidence interval problem, is to make a conclusion. So let's make our conclusion. 
Remember the question originally said, is there evidence that the mean mental skill scores of these two groups of babies are different? Well, let's interpret the interval. Remember we had, I can still see it from the calculator. I'm just gonna record the calculator's interval up here. Ours I know was just slightly different, but I'll just use this now. Um, so what am I gonna write? I'm gonna say something like this. I am 95% confident that the interval that we just found, negative 15.16, up to negative 4.844, 95% confident that it captures what we're after. Remember when we identified the parameters back up in the original step, step P? It captures the difference in mean mental scores for babies that use and don't use walkers. And I'll go ahead and just rewrite symbolically what we were after. Okay, so I'm 95% confident that that interval from about negative 15 to not quite negative five captures the difference in mean mental skill scores for babies that use and don't use walkers. The original question said, do you have evidence? So I want you to remember, there's a really critical number that we look for in confidence intervals and that number is the number zero. I do not see the number zero in this interval. This interval is entirely negative. So because the interval, we can write this, because the interval does not contain zero, then I'm gonna say because it does not contain zero, we have evidence that the mean, I'm gonna answer the question now, the mean mental scores for babies that use, don't use walkers, that they are different. And answering that answers the question. The question just said, do you have evidence that the mean mental scores, lost an M there, the mean mental scores for babies that use and don't use walkers are different. And I'm answering that, yes, we do have evidence right here. We have evidence. And the evidence comes from that interval. Um, in fact, I could even say this, because the order that we subtracted in was this order, because when I do that subtraction, I'm getting negative results here, that must mean that this mean score for the babies that use walkers, we have evidence it's actually lower than the mean score for babies that don't use walkers. Because if I subtract these and I get a difference of negative 15 up to almost negative five, then that's telling me that these babies that use walkers, we think their mean score is anywhere from about 15 points lower to almost five points lower than the mean mental scores of babies that do not use the walkers, okay? All right, so I hope that helps you with, with working through a panic for the, the difference of two means uh, for, for two different populations here. Um, hopefully that helps if you have questions. Please ask us, let us know if you have questions. And at this point, you can work on homework four and homework five in chapter 10. And I will talk with you later.